All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. I know that uh, there must have been something, you know, up with the, uh, the, the screen monitors outside. I, I know our session didn't make it onto the screen monitors, so hopefully people will, you know, continue to file in. But anyways, I, I want to thank everyone for coming and welcome everyone to the session. Um, so uh, my name is Roger Lee. I'm the uh, urologic oncologist at Moffitt Cancer Center, and I'm really, really excited about the discussion that we're going to be putting on today amongst the panelists here, as well as with all of you, um, to, discuss, to discuss some of the pointers how we can advance research on rare GU subtypes um, going forward. So without further ado, I wanted to uh, start off with a couple of introductions. Um, so the first one is going to be by Dr. Phil Spies from Moffitt. Uh, introducing the concept behind the Global Society of Rare GU Tumors. And then um, the, the next talk was supposed to be given by Dr. Ashish Kamat, but uh, unfortunately his flight schedule got uh, changed a little bit and he won't be with us, but I'll be happy to uh, speak on his behalf. So without further ado, Phil, if you wanted to um, take it away. Uh, Dr. Lee, there's no uh, sort of, uh, you know, everyone is aware he's been in really, I would say, one of the, I would say, beyond rising stars, I would say, superstars in urethial cancer research. And Roger has done some really great research at our institution, but it really has embraced being the chair of the Genomics Committee of the GSRGT. And it really done some exceptional work gathering, I would say, very talented people from across the globe and really using really key resources that we have access to. So, Jeff Ross, some of you may know, uh, really is a, a medical director at Foundation Medicine, and these are some of our other ta very talented colleagues. I've really started looking at variant histologies, at really types of cancers where really we ultimately don't even know key uh, signatures, genomic signatures, or other personalized type of uh, approaches we can take in improving patient outcomes. And this is just one of several projects that Roger and his committee has really led really looking at the genomic characterization of plasma cytoid bladder cancer, also CDH1 specific uh, urethial cancers, and really identifying what mutations are identified using the ample resources within foundation medicine and correlating it with clinical uh, data for, for these patients. And really starting to give us the ultimate information we need to understand a little bit better about what are the key drivers that develop these tumors and potentially will help us uh, target them in terms of uh, novel agents. Some of the really great work also that's sort of being conducted is looking at, for example, TMB, tumor mutational burden, high penile squamous cell carcinoma, understanding how immunotherapies may be beneficial, understanding how we could target these, also understanding and characterizing them in both the HPV positive and negative subtypes in terms of really developing key, uh, really understanding how we improve patient outcomes. So the society again was developed over two years ago I'm very, very proud that I think we have a lot of exceptional initiatives taking place, which I think are ultimately going to improve the care of our patients moving forward. I just had a, a conversation earlier. There's some very exciting uh, collaboratives going on in, in germ cell cancer with colleagues in uh, within the IGCCG, as well as within uh, the uh, European uh, consensus guidelines to try to advance the care of patients with germ cell cancers, particular seminomas, for example, which are chemo refractory and other types of the malignant transformation tumors. And similarly to that, I think we have a focus on other areas like penile, uh, like melanoma, sarcomas. We have a group that developed in our adrenal group as well has been quite successful in doing so. And uh, we have our website, which has relaunched. We are currently adding content to it to improve it. And I'm very excited about this collaborative with the IBCG. I think that really is going to really to be the next step in working collaboratively to improve uh, patient outcomes, particularly with these unusual histologies and variants where we're always challenged into under, understanding how we should best treat them in terms of multimodal treatments. This is my contact and the GSRGT's contact information. I want to thank you uh, very, very much. Again, I just want to highlight our, our, our current focus is clinical trials. Some very exciting work that uh, Andrew Necki is leading to develop our first of many trials in the GSRGT uh, space and, and promoting it and developing as the key organization to promote trials in the rare cancer space in patient advocacy and in partnerships. We're always very interested in partnering with key organizations who have a similar mission in terms of our patient, improving patient advocacy, patient outcomes, and promoting best level uh, you know, evidence of care and education resources for patients and their families. 
Thanks again for your attention. I really appreciate it. And again, thank you very much to Beacon for allowing me to participate in the meeting today. Great. Thank you so much, Phil. And, uh, you know, for for those that didn't uh, know, so Moffitt is actually undergoing a transition to a new surgical hospital. And um, Phil, uh, serving as the, uh, the um, surgical services director, he's kind of in charge of like the, all the logistics and everything else that's with the transition. So he's very busy and really thank you very much for uh, the time that you allotted uh, to be here with us through Zoom. Um, and you do get a pass for your time limit, but I will hold the rest of the speakers <laughs> to their time limits. So if I can have the slides up for the IBCG. Um, and so we'll, we'll try to keep the introductory remarks um, hopefully to a minimum because I really wanted to get everybody's input on the discussion on how to really advance the, um, and if we can go to Dr. Kamat's slides, please, uh, to, to really understand where the, the key pain points are in um, the research having to do with various subtypes and how we as a group can try to move the needle and advance the field forward. That would be great. All right, so um, Ashish Kamad uh, is the director of the International Bladder Cancer Group and unfortunately couldn't be here today with us because of some travel uh, flight changes um, and asked me to give this talk on his behalf. So the International Bladder Cancer Group was originally founded in the mid-2000s. It started off with 10 members to several different members that are shown here. And its mission really is to um, advance the research and understanding of bladder cancer and to also educate um, the general public about uh, our, our um, research uh, results. And so as part of that, uh, there has been a number of key publications that were generated by the IBCG, including definitions and endpoints on BCG unresponsive disease, um, intermediate risk bladder cancer, so on and so forth. We've also put on a couple of sessions at the AUA over the last couple of years, um, hosting debates on various points of uh, debate, hot points of debate on bladder cancer management, which has been a success. Recently, Ashish uh, Shilpa Gupta and colleagues had uh, gone on to Chile to help them um, really advance their uh, bladder cancer management guidelines, and this was actually adopted by the Chilean government. Um, and so this was also another success. And with that, um, in line with that, we have formed a, a joint commission, if you will, between the IBCG and the GSRGT uh, to really understand the, the subtypes of bladder cancer, urothelial tumors. Um, because this is a rare disease that is the focus of research for both groups, you know, we thought that it was very much in the interest of both groups to come together bring in key stakeholders to really understand this disease and also try to help move the research forward. Um, so our, a couple of our missions is to identify the knowledge gaps that uh, having to do with the biological, genomic, and clinical endpoints, um, to prioritize the unmet needs in terms of research, education, and clinical trials, and also to obtain funding in the future going forward to really help us understand this disease better. So um, with that, I'll, I, I um, will uh, just kind of launch into the, uh, the, the different talks first. And what we'll do is we'll group the, the talks together of the similar themes and we'll kind of leave some time in between for a discussion. Um, so the first speaker, I obviously have a very distinguished panel here um, with me today, and I'm really glad to have you guys here for a very exciting session. So the first talk will be from Dr. Francesca Connie from the Wild Cornell um, School of Medicine. She is a pathologist and uh, has done a lot of research in um, the pathology that having to do with rare GU tumors. And so without further ado, Dr. Connie, we'll turn it over to you. Hi, thank you for the introduction and thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm Francesca Cani, a GU pathologist at Weill Cornell Medicine. And so today we're going to talk about um, what constitutes variant histology in urothelial carcinoma. 
So first I want to start out by saying this used to be called variant histology. Um, we're getting away from this terminology. There's been an update to the nomenclature. And now we are calling these subtypes of urothelial carcinoma. Again, this is in the new WHO fifth edition, which was just released last year. And this updated nomenclature um, has been proposed since um, variant is commonly used to denote genomic alterations in um, all sorts of tumors. And so we are terming the, the variant um, histologic patterns as subtypes now. So for the remainder of the talk, I'll be referring to um, these variants as subtypes, or I'll try to. I, I slip up sometimes, too. Um, so this is a list of the urothelial carcinoma subtypes. Um, <clears throat> you have conventional urothelial carcinoma. There are urothelial carcinomas with divergent differentiation, um, squamous, glandular, and trophoblastic, which I'll touch on. But really, I'm going to focus on um, these, the rest of the um, tumors in this, the, the rest of the patterns in this list, which are the histologic subtypes. Um, major change, on the only changes from the 2016 um, fourth edition of the WHO are just some slight modifications to the, um, to these subtypes, namely that large nested urothelial carcinoma is now a separate subtype from nested. Those used to be grouped. Um, and the microcystic uh, subtype of urothelial carcinoma now includes, um, we've added tubular to the name because that can have a tubular pattern as well. But aside from those, um, these subtypes have been the same um, from the prior edition. And what I really want to focus on in this talk um, are these subtypes, micropapillary, plasmacytoid, um, giant cell, sarcomatoid, and poorly differentiated. I want to draw your attention to these because these have the strongest evidence of having more aggressive behavior um, than conventional urothelial carcinoma. Um, micropapillary, plasmacytoid, and sarcomatoid are a little bit more common. Um, giant cell and poorly differentiated are exceptionally rare. Um, we don't have a lot of data on those, but nonetheless, they are more aggressive. So one point I do want to bring up right away is that um, there's ample evidence to, to show that subtype histology in urothelial carcinoma is definitely underreported. Um, in community practices, a lot of community practice pathologists um, don't report these. They're sort of under-recognized. Um, and patholo central pathology re-review does um, have a lot of uh, reclassification of these tumors when um, reviewed by spe subspecialized GU pathologists. And so why does this matter? Why should we care if subtype histology is being underreported? Um, so for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, as you know, the NCCN guidelines, which are based on the AUA risk groups, um, they consider subtype histology a very high risk feature. Um, so that affects treatment decisions, putting patients in that very high risk group. Um, the biggest treatment decision it affects is that it does warrant at least consideration of early cystectomy for PT1 disease in patients who have um, they, um, these subtype histologies. Um, and again, uh, <clears throat> they specify that micropapillary plasmacytoid and sarcomatoid are um, very um, are aggressive, and so those, those are the ones you really want to consider um, early cystectomy. And I would probably throw in giant cell and, and poorly differentiated into that as well. For muscle invasive bladder cancer, um, subtype histology also matters, uh, more for prognosis than for therapy, um, because the prognosis in uh, urothelial carcinomas that are stage PT2 to T4 are not influenced just by pathologic stage at cystectomy, but also the presence of these aggressive subtypes. Um, there is also some retrospective data to suggest that there's limited benefit to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, particularly in the micropapillary and sarcomatoid subtypes, but again, this is retrospective data. We haven't changed our management or, or have, um, you know, recommended not to give neoadjuvant therapy, but there is some um, data showing that there's not as much benefit to that. So focusing on these aggressive subtypes and what we see in um, pathology. So the first subtype is the micropapillary subtype a first aggressive subtype. Um, this is composed of small clusters of tumor cells. They don't have fibrovascular cores, and they're surrounded by these lacunar spaces. Um, generally, you want to see multiple clusters of tumor cells within a single uh, lacunar space. There have been studies, reproducibility studies on this, showing that that's actually the best uh, histologic feature for um, diagnosis. And these are often, uh, you do see a high um, rate of overexpression or amplification of HER2 new, which may have treatment implications in this um, tumor. Um, I want to touch on interobserver variability in some of these subtypes. And there is quite a bit of interobserver variability with micropapillary um, subtype because a lot of tumors, even just a conventional urothelial carcinoma, can show what we see, uh, we call retraction artifact 
around the tumor, and that can really mimic um, micropapillary histology. So um, that's one uh, source of interobserver variability. But again, the most reproducible feature is these multiple um, nests of cells within one lacunar space. Move on to the plasma cytoid subtype. Showing this low power image on the right, um, you can see, I don't have a pointer, but the top of the image has the urothelial surface, the lamina propria below it, and then the deep muscularis propria layer at the bottom of the screen. And um, what you can sort of see are these blue cells kind of trickling. There's some chronic inflammation in there, and then there's this other kind of loosely, uh, loosely cohesive um, group of blue cells kind of traversing the lamina propria and muscularis propria. And at higher magnification, uh, we see Lymphocytes are on the top, those dark, dark blue cells, and then infiltrating below and through that muscle layer um, are these other cells that are kind of basically infiltrative and look distinct from those lymphocytes. Um, much higher magnification reveals that these are single infiltrating cells. They have a plasma cytoid appearance. Note they have very eccentric, uh, eccentrically placed nuclei pushed to the side, and they look very much like plasma cells. Um, they have discohesive growth, and that means that they can spread very easily along tissue planes and peritoneal surfaces, which lends to, uh, we think lends its aggressive behavior. Um, these are associated with somatic mutations in CDH1 and um, loss of E cadherin. So the plasma cytoid subtype does um, have some inter-observer variability issues um, that can arise, mostly because there's a variety of morphologies that can show similarly discohesive growth patterns. I've showed a variety of morphologies on the right. And they all have slightly different appearances. I'll call your attention to the picture on the bottom right um, on figure F. Um, these cells have more of a rhabdoid appearance, and rhabdoid morphology in bladder cancer can also have discohesive growth, and whether that should be put under plasma cytoid, I think some pathologists might classify that as plasma cytoid, and others may consider it separate as rhabdoid. So there are some um, you know, issues with agreement on this particular subtype that are, I think, still being worked out. Um, the sarcomatoid subtype is basically urothelial carcinoma that has an appearance that's indistinguishable um, from sarcoma. What helps us to diagnose these is when we have a good in situ component. The image on the top left, you see a nice surface of CIS, and then below it is this spindled um, sarcomatoid uh, carcinoma. Really looks indistinguishable from a sarcoma in anywhere else in the body. Um, these sarcomatoid carcinomas, urothelial carcinomas, can have heterologous elements as well, and those should be reported osteosarcomas, chondrosarcomas, um, these actually portend an even worse um, behavior within the uh, sarcomatoid subtype. Um, the giant cell and poorly differentiated subtypes or other aggressive subtypes, these are extraordinarily rare. Um, giant cell subtype basically has bizarre pleomorphic giant cells. You can see a nucleus that's enormous in that photo. Um, and the poorly differentiated uh, subtype basically lacks morphologic features that even point to urothelial origin. So here we, on the bottom right, we see um, just a sheet of poorly differentiated epithelioid cells. And these are both highly aggressive, but again, very rare, and we don't have a lot of data about them. So I'm gonna touch on the other subtypes of urothelial carcinoma and mention why they also matter, even though they don't necessarily influence um, prognosis. Um, the nested and large su nested subtypes, again, these have been separated as two distinct subtypes. Um, these are composed of nests of very bland cell urothelial cells. They infiltrate the lamina propria, muscularis propria, um, and these are invasive. And the reason why um, these are important variants for uh, important subtype for pathologists to recognize is that they have a deceptively bland histology. Um, again, nested has smaller nests, large nested has larger nests. But um, the main point here is that on a very superficial bladder biopsy specimen where you're only seeing um, the surface, it's going to be very difficult to distinguish this from a von Brun's nest, which, has, which is benign, um, due to this bland histology and the bland cytology that you see here. So they can be very tricky in diagnosis, um, especially in a limited sample. And so um, this is why you know, this subtype is important. Um, these subtypes are not, um, have not been shown to be independent predictors of survival when accounting for stage, but that being said, they do tend to present um, at higher stages. The tubular and microcystic subtypes, um, these are closely related to the nested subtype, and they're similar in that they have very bland, um, cytologically bland cells. Um, they line tubular and microcystic descendant structures, and again, similar to how the nested variants mimic von Brun's nest, 
this tends to mimic cystitis cystica glandularis, which is also which is benign. And again, the bland histology um, in a very limited sample um, can be very easily mistaken for a benign process or, or vice versa. The lymphoepithelial-like subtype, um, this is composed of sheets and clusters of undifferentiated cells. They do tend to have poorly defined um, borders. So the tumor here is kind of the top left and the top right. Um, and below it are these smaller bluer cells, which is the dense inflammatory infiltrate that's associated with this tumor. Um, this, this subtype is important because um, these, they, uh, at least data suggests that they have a, may have a better um, overall survival. They do tend to be enriched for PDL1 expression. Um, and some data has suggested that there's some more sensitivity to chemotherapy, and there's um, some potential for immune checkpoint inhibitors um, as really good therapeutic options for these tumors, despite this sort of poorly differentiated appearance of, of the epithelial component here. Um, this does tend to have a better prognosis. The lipid-rich subtype um, is composed of lipoblast-like cells. So this image on the right, this really looks like, these look like adipocytes. Um, and so you have these, cyto these large cytoplasmic vacuoles indenting the nuclei. These can really, these are important for pathologists to recognize because this can really mimic liposarcoma. So in a metastatic site, this could be very difficult. You, you wouldn't, a pathologist wouldn't automatically think of a urothelial carcinoma, but urothelial carcinoma can have this morphology in this subtype. Um, and again, this is a pretty rare subtype has been associated with poor outcomes, so we might want to move that into the aggressive subtype, but there's overall very limited data about it. The clear cell glycogen-rich subtype, um, this, time, this terminology has been updated a little bit. Um, glycogen-rich has been added um, in parentheses to clear cell to distinguish it from a clear cell adenocarcinoma, which is different and more aggressive. Um, this is a urothelial carcinoma that has an accumulation of glycogen in its tumor cells. Um, pretty rare. We don't really know much about its prognosis. And the real important, uh, importance of recognizing this uh, subtype is that it mimics clear cell renal cell carcinoma. So in a metastatic site, especially, pathologists might not be thinking about urothelial carcinoma. Um, and even in the primary site of the bladder, you might think of a metastatic renal cell. Um, so it's very important to realize that urothelial carcinomas can have this morphology. I'm just going to touch on divergent differentiation. Um, you can have squamous, glandular, trophoblastic. Um, squamous differentiation, keratin pearls um, in the tumor. Glandular, you have glandular um, type epithelium infiltrating the uh, lamina propria here. And with trophoblastic differentiation, um, you have these syncytial trophoblasts, big multinucleated giant cells, and they are also HCG positive. Um, these, I bring these up because these are, I just want to make the distinction that urothelial carcinoma with divergent differentiation is distinct from um, a pure squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder or a pure adenocarcinoma or urachal carcinoma, which does not have a conventional urothelial carcinoma component. And there are treatment implications to that. Pure squamous cell carcinomas don't usually get um, neoadjuvant therapy, whereas a urothelial carcinoma with squamous differentiation um, should be um, treated as such. And this, at least in the squamous and glandular um, differentiation, we don't really see an association with um, high, a worse prognosis um, accounting for stage. So another reason for subtype reporting, and I've um, been alluding to this, but metastases often show subtype histology, even if the original tumor had a very low percentage of the subtype. This is particularly true in the aggressive subtypes like micropapillary plasmacytoid. And you might not see a conventional urothelial carcinoma within the metastasis. So being aware um, of that subtype histology is helpful in, in diagnosing metastatic urothelial carcinoma. Um, <clears throat> so if distant metastases are biopsied down the line, if you do have the subtype reporting on the primary tumor, this helps pathologists to recognize it as a uh, metastatic urothelial carcinoma when that might not jump to mind um, right away, as shown by the examples I, I showed. So some of the, one of the biggest unresolved issues with subtypes. First of all, conventional urothelial carcinoma is often mixed, has mixed subtype histology. In fact, some of those images I showed you were actually from the same case that showed different um, subtypes within one tumor. Um, we, it is currently recommended to report percentage of the tumor of subtype um, histology, but one of the issues is that there's really no standardized percentage for um, considering a tumor that overall classification of that subtype. For example, like top lining your report as micropapillary urothelial carcinoma. We don't have a standardized percentage for how much of the tumor should show that morphology to classify it overall. 
Um, in contrast, in breast pathology, we have a very clear cutoff given by the WHO. It's greater than 90% of the tumor has to show the special type of histology, like tubular or cribriform, and then it's called an invasive tubular carcinoma. Um, but we don't really have that because we don't really have the data um, to show what that percentage might be. Um, for Dr. Apollo's uh, iconic uh, alliance trial, looking at rare GU tumors, we are um, using greater than 50% subtype histology for enrollment. We felt that that was a good cutoff. At least the majority of the tumor had that subtype because it is actually pretty rare to see um, urothelial carcinomas with a pure um, subtype histology. So take home points. Um, reporting subtype histology in urothelial carcinoma is highly nuanced. Um, aggressive subtypes have both prognostic and therapeutic implications. The micropapillary plasmacytoid and sarcomatoid subtypes are the ones to really remember as being more aggressive. And um, I always advocate for central pathology review for clinical trial patients um, by subspecialized GU pathologists when possible um, because this would really reduce inter-observer variability in um, issues in subtype reporting. Happy to take any questions. <laughs> <clears throat> I think certainly if the metastasis shows like that variant at all, then yeah, or subtype. <laughs> so yeah. One quick question. Mm -hmm. Great talk. Um, yep. I'm a Sephora from Dana Farber. We know there's different, you know, with upper tract and lower tract disease. We get very little tissue as medical oncologists. How do we how do we account for the subtype histologies and the prevalence of upper tract or renal pelvis cancer. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the, the last part of your question. Oh, just how, <laughs> you know, when our urologists give us for especially, you know, upper tract and then your ureter, we, we know more, you know, they're just different biologies too, yeah. but we can see some of these. So how is a pathologist, how do we account when we get such little tissue yeah. to say like, is there a squamous? Is there a... It's yeah. very difficult, I think. Um, on a very small biopsy, like you said, especially in the upper tract where you don't see the whole tumor, you're not going to always get this morphology on the biopsy. And so it'll be diagnosed as, you know, urothelial carcinoma. Um, in contrast, you might only get that, that subtype and you might think the whole tumor has micropapillary architecture, but, you know, maybe it's just a small component. So that's always an issue with sampling in, in pathology, um, unfortunately, but we can only... Yeah. Kyle Richards, University of Wisconsin. Uh, where does the neuroendocrine fall into this uh, subtype, That's or is a, it a separate? So I knew someone was going to ask that. <laughs> as, as I finished the talk, I was like, I didn't talk about neuroendocrine. Uh, one of the reasons that, so in the new WHO, neuroendocrine uh, tumors of the GU tract have now been kind of pulled out into their own chapter. So they're like its own sort of section on neuroendocrine tumors. Prostate, bladder have all been kind of grouped into one section. Um, you can, can still, you do often see neuroendocrine differentiation with conventional urothelial carcinoma, and so you could consider it a type of, of divergent differentiation, and certainly probably one, that, you know, definitely one that's more aggressive when there's a small cell component. Um, but that has actually, like I said, just kind of been discussed separately in the WHO as its own, um, yeah, as its own kind of chapter of neuroendocrine GU tumors in general. That's a, that's a weird decision based on that. Because we see patients go in and out of neuroendocrine. They'll have neuroendocrine and then they'll recur as a conventional and vice versa. Yeah. So that's, that's odd. It is anyway. odd. I mean, it's still, again, would be considered aggressive, especially with a small cell component. Um, yeah. But it's well, just kind yeah. of pulled out separately in, okay. yeah. Um, I'm Isla Skinner from uh, Stanford. So we're seeing more and more just on TUR specimens where our pathologists will read multiple different uh, subtypes. Yeah. And what are we going to, it's, I don't know what to do with it today, but I really don't know what we're going to do with it long term in terms of figuring out prognosis and what we should pay attention to. Yeah. I mean, I, th I would think that the, you know, the more aggressive subtypes are going to drive that prognosis. If you have an element of micropapillary or plasma cytoid, that's probably going to be what drives the tumor. We definitely see that morphology and the metastases, you know, even when it's a small component. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, a lot of the pictures I showed were from like a single case. <laughs> so thank you.
thank you so much Francis uh, for this uh, excellent talk and we will move directly to uh, another talk exploring the very various subtypes in breast cancer with the Dr. Hakmat Al Ahmadi, so uh, professor of pathology uh, at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and he will give us an, an overview on the genomic consideration for those rare variants. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. First, I give uh, uh, Karima credit for saying my name correctly, <laughs> Al Ahmadi, and for those who did not know what she said, it's the same as Alamadi in general. <laughs> but uh, you know, you feel special when someone saying your name correct. So, uh, so I'm a, a attending pathologist associate, and I recently took the role of scientific director of MSK Biobank, and I'll be touching upon some of the genetic aspects of uh, variant histology or subtypes. There'll be quite a bit of overlap because uh, you kind of start with the, with the morphology for now with what Kani presented, but I'll try to kind of limit that uh, until, unless it is, uh, it's really uh, needed. And also disclosure, I do not necessarily follow the WHO in terms of when it comes to neuroendocrine. I still call them variant or like subtypes and I use them with differentiation. Uh, I, I agree with everyone, the decision was not necessarily scientifically based, but, but we'll deal with it. And maybe with the next round, we'll probably try to revise that. Uh, that distinction. Uh, just take a quick look, a uh, refresher of some of the variant, the morphologic spectrum of urothelial carcinomas. And uh, the way I like to always start with this, because just to show you, can I have a reference point uh, and also to highlight an important aspect, which is almost every histologic subtype starts from a urothelial precursor. And this is very important to keep in mind that these are not just tumors just develop as they are different histology from bladder. They all have precur pre uh, re precursors. And if they don't have that, then they become different subtypes, like adenocarcinomas if there's no urothelial, as Dr. Kani mentioned, or squamous cell carcinoma, and you don't have any urothelial precursor. And that is important because when you look at them, they're not one subtype. They're not variant histology. So when you talk about variant histology, it's important to keep in mind that these are not unique. They're not one entity. Uh, and then depending on the, the mechanism, how they develop, you could see tumors going from uh, staying as a, as a, a morphology, as an epithelial tumor, but different histology like glandular uh, micropapillary nested, and sometimes they lose their entire epithelial or nearly entire epithelial differentiation, such as uh, neuroendocrine or sarcomatoid. So if you're talking about plasticity, you may be talking about kind of different type of wide categories of plasticities, things that remain within the epithelial category and things that may move into a different line of differentiation. And since all of these you know, subtypes start as urothelial, their, their genetics are going to be influenced and impacted by the genetics of urothelial carcinoma NOS, which is, you know, uh, now we have the most uh, evidence or more comprehensive analysis from the TCA, which is pretty much familiar to everyone in this audience. What we know from this is the urothelial carcinoma is genetically heterogeneous as it is morphologically heterogeneous. There are different you know, mutational processes, mutagenic signatures, um, different pre prevalence of different mutation subtypes, uh, on oncogenic pathways, and it's not uncommon. Actually, it's a more common uh, scenario where a urothelial carcinoma can have abnormalities in a you know, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase and a cell cycle regulator and a chromatin re uh, remodeling gene. So all of these kind of overlap to kind of form urothelial carcinoma. And we will see, at least in the sub subtypes that have been studied, that this remains the case. So the genetic background of any subtype is urothelial, and then there is something additional to it. And by expression profiling, uh, again, we have the major divided into basal luminal, and you have the subset of uh, neuroendoc and neur neuronal or neuroendocrine um, subtype that is enriched in, uh, in neuroendocrine or small cell carcinomas. I uh, remind you that the TCGA focused on no variant histology. The, the, there were strict criteria to include urothelial carcinoma and OS, even though there are a few variants that kind of slipped in, especially the squamous and, and a few endocrine carcinoma. But that also left the, the subtypes of urothelial carcinoma out of these major sequencing efforts. There was a little bit of link to the morphologic subtype and the subsequent consensus classification where people, you know, the investigators start, you know, accumulating the data that, were, that was part of the sequencing effort. And we can see some, some clustering or some uh, reference. For example, micropapillary carcinoma is clustered in a subset of the luminal uh, uh, subtype, uh, but other, other morphologic subtypes that were in the luminal, including the luminal category, were like nested, plasma cytoid, 
uh, and angular, angular uh, glandular, according to some other uh, subsequent literature, which was based mostly based on immunohistochemical expression, where people wanted to kind of trim down the 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 basal luminal ca categories into a few immunohistochemical markers that can be easily or more or more widely applied. At the same time, uh, basal markers or basal tumors, in addition to the squamous, which is almost universally uh, basal, we can see a subset of the sarcomatoid carcinomas are clustered under the basal subtype as well, and the other part will probably be uh, a stroma-rich subtype, and the lymphoepithelioma-like uh, carcinoma that Dr. Kani mentioned earlier, this uh, also clustered in the basal uh, subtypes. So uh, we mentioned the... Uh, the, the, some of the specific variant histologies, and I'm going to show mostly two examples where we did uh, a lot of work, and they represent two extremes. One, which is the plasma cytoid carcinoma, where uh, once, since we started developing this interest, and we always likened it to lobular carcinoma of the breast, and we investigated it that way, and we found that, yes, indeed, that in a, in that tumor ha is characterized by you know, recurrent loss of some you know, a cadherin or CDH1 uh, in, in the tumor. Uh, otherwise, if you look at the background, these tumors have a very similar genetic background like urothelial carcinoma uh, NOS. And that finding was, you know, uh, important in identifying uh, plasma cytoid histology in mixed tumors. If, you're, if you have the chance to sequence both of them, as we did here, you could see that CDH1 is restricted to the plasma cytoid component, but not to the your theory component, but these tumors in general shared alterations. And sometimes in another example, all that you need to do is uh, e-cadherin stain and can nicely separate the two components uh, uh, for you. Uh, one point to my reference to Dr. Apollo, one, one of the things unique about plasma cytoid carcinoma is unlike other, all the other subtypes, it tends to be pure when it's present. We've seen some mixed cases, but if you have a report of like really focal plasma cytoid, be careful, it may not necessarily be plasma cytoid. That could be just a poorly differentiated component from a urothelial carcinoma. So if you have, if you have the means to confirm it by e cadherin loss, that'll be great. Otherwise, it's not, it, can I suspect it first before you confirm it? It does happen, and i have shown you these are two examples here where there is mixed, but most of the times it's nearly pure when it's present. Uh, so that was one example where a unique genetic finding can define a subset for the most cases for now at least. Um, then you'll see the other examples, there, there will be no unique genetic finding. Another subset where genomic you know, um, um, sequencing can identify a subset is that the adenocarcinoma, when you're trying to differentiate them from glandular differentiation in the carcinoma, you can see whether it's uracal or bladder adenocarcinoma they really do not have the, the same genetic events that are commonly seen in your carcinoma, like chromatin demanding genes are not present, hardly any tort promoter mm -hmm. mutation, but they have enrichment and alterations like KRAS uh, or SMAT4, which are typical of other uh, pure adenocarcinomas in other organs. And how that might be helpful, this is one example. It's rare, so no one should get scared of this, but this is a case where you have, we had a urothelial carcinoma and glandular component within the same tumor, really within a few millimeters of each other, and sometimes we were even intermixed. And the first impression was this is urothelial carcinoma with extensive glandular differentiation. When we separated the two components and sequenced them, we started first with our target panel. There were like no genetic, no, there is no overlap. No, no, no mutations were shared between the two components. And, and then if you look at them carefully you know, in, or individually, the, they followed with the typical, what we know about adenocarcinomas of the bladder, KRAS, P53, and then the urethral component had you know, uh, two alterations, tort promoter mutation, uh, RP, and all other alterations. Even though also the two components had P53 mutations, they were distinct. Each one has its, its uh, different mutations. We wanted to confirm, we went further, we did whole exome uh, sequencing on the, on the both components, and still we did not find a single mutation shared between the two tumors. Again, that confirmed to us that in this rare scenario, you're not seeing a urothelial carcinoma with glandular differentiation. We're seeing a two, two tumors here arising simultaneously within the same bladder, adenocarcinoma and urothelial carcinoma. Again, mind you that this is, this is a rare occurrence. Most of the times you're going to be seeing urothelial with glandular differentiation. So this, this is going to be a part of a paper that we hope to publish soon, led by Carissa Chu and Jessica Chen um, and, uh, at, at MSK. 
So we'll move now to some, share with you some of the work that we did recently and published in collaboration with, with the team at uh, UPenn, Hershey, and some other uh, investi uh, institutions as well. Uh, we studied urothelial carcinoma squamous differentiation, just a quick reference, you know, this, it could have it many different ways. It could be distinct geographic regions of urothelial and squamous, but other times it could be, you know, clusters of squamous differentiation within the bulk of the tumor. Uh, we know that squamous differentiation almost uh, always follows these, the basal subtype, as we can see here in the TCGA uh, paper, where upon re-review of the cases, we were able to confirm that these were all squamous differentiation, and all, almost all of them were in the basal subtype. But at the same time, there is a big chunk of this basal subtype that did not have any squamous differentiation. So that was why we were kind of were interested. Uh, and we went, you know, we, we, we designed a very detailed study we separated, we combined tumors from Memorial, from Penn State, uh, Hershey, from Vanderbilt, and we did you know, macro dissection, and we did whole exome and whole transcriptome uh, sequencing on them. Uh, one thing that stood out, there was a lot of overlap between the urothelial and squamous regions, indicating that they're all arising from the same precursor tumor, but there was like no unique genetic event that could distinguish squamous from urothelial in any of the cases. Uh, so that was a little bit disappointing, uh, but then something else also came out is that there's all, there was always higher mutation count and tumor mutation burden and new antigen load in the, in the squamous component compared to, to the erythelial component and also higher ploidy, so they're indicating that there's more genetic instability in this variant or this uh, divergent differentiation. And when we looked at our prospectively sequen sequenced cohort, when we looked at erythelial versus squamous, cases with squamous differentiation, the genetic background, again, was very, very similar, with the exception of some uh, alterations like P53 or CDKN2A, they, which were a little bit enriched in the squamous com uh, component. Otherwise, there wasn't really a, a, a you know, significant finding that, that could differentiate squamous from urothelial. So we knew the genetics were not necessarily the driver of the subtype, so what else was there? So we relied on the the uh, transcriptome or the RNA-seq, uh, which, as expected, all the squamous components were uh, classified as, as basal, whereas the, urothelial, the corresponding urothelial component were mostly basal, but in, in four of the 12 samples that were successful, they were most, more uh, luminal subtype. Again, here when we start seeing some discrepancy. But when we looked at these bare ex uh, samples, every time we looked at, uh, at, at the urothelial and squamous component, even though they were both basal by, by uh, bulk clustering, you could always see that squamous component from the same tumor has more basal signature and lower, lumin uh, and lower luminal signature, and the other way around was the same. A urethelial component has higher luminal signature and lower basal signature. And no surprise when we looked, you know, separated them by histology, they were two distinct groups. There were many differentially expressed genes that were they're mostly pointed towards skin development and squamous differentiation in, in, in other organs. But when we looked also at the individual uh, genes, we, we were able to find that some of these powerful transcription factors uh, that are involved in maintaining urothelial identity and differentiation were the ones that were always, almost always downregulated between the urothelial and the squamous component, namely here FOXA1, uh, GATA3, and BPR gamma. And then to kind of delve a little bit uh, uh, into, into more details about the, this, this entity, we had a case of that we were able to get single cell RNA sequencing. And when we did that, this case had extensive squamous differentiation, and you can see the h &E image. But then by single cell, we were able to find different distinct uh, cell clusters that, that recapitulated the findings of skin, normal skin development. Uh, as if I show you some examples here, a cluster that was enriched with CK5 that is typical, typically present in the basal cell layer of the normal skin. Another cluster had these uh, spinous cells, the suprabasal uh, skin layer that was enriched with, with these desmosomes, like genes that are involved in, in making the, the desmosomes, desmocollins and desmoglein. And then the bulk of the cells were cells that have keratinocytes in transition or reactive keras keratinocytes. Uh, and then, interestingly, even despite the fact that this was extensively squamous, there were some cells showing low expression of FOXA1, can probably keeping their uh, luminal or urothelial uh, um, you know, memory in, in them, but they were still at a lower uh, expression level. So how significant that was when, uh, when we were looking at this, we had 
also had access to samples from a clinical trial in, uh, in which patients received a single agent atezolizumab from locally advanced urothelial carcinoma. We didn't have access to the tissue, but we were able to review the slides. And we, we found that the, from the nine of the, uh, uh, the 26 patients who, uh, who derived benefit from the treatment had a lack of tumor heterogeneity. So they were more, the tumors were more uniform, while the tumors that the patients who did not uh, benefit had more heterogeneity uh, in, in their tumors, and that was reflected on also the, the immune subtypes that were, uh, uh, that were different between the urethelia and the squamous component. And by immune cell deconvolution analysis also, there were difference, uh, uh, significant differences in the type of immune cell infiltrate between urethelia, the urethelia and the squamous uh, components of, of the same uh, tumor, and that was also highlighted by uh, the BDL1 expression. So the conclusion was that it, as much as you would like to say urothelial and squamous are two distinct uh, entities and there is like abrupt change from one to the other, in reality there is always a transition and depending where the tumor falls, you may be easily urothelial or uh, squamous. I think I should speed up a little bit, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so neuroendocrine carcinoma was, was mentioned in the, in the, uh, from the audience and I I agree that this is a unique tumor, uh, still urothelial. Uh, the best outcome is when you have a localized tumor that you can treat with chemotherapy. Genetically, again, we had some, some work done and then other groups have done the same. There's no unique genetic event that can dictate the development of urothelial carcinoma. The genetic background here is very similar uh, to urothelial carcinoma. It's different from small cell carcinoma of the lung, for example. Uh, and then now we have more information about them, how there, there are some transcri major transcription factors that can govern the transition from neurothelia to neural, neuronal subtypes, and these uh, transcription factors, uh, ASCL1, neuro-D1, and BOTO of 3 de define this, a unique subsets of urothelial carcinomas with different levels of expression of neuroendocrine markers. Micropapillary carcinoma was mentioned, it's enriched with uh, activating mutations on, on, on HER2, but also amplification of HER2 as well. One thing that is unique about this subtype is that HER2 amplification and, and overexpression can be very heterogeneous, and most of the times it will be restricted to the micropapillary component, not to the urethelial component. But sometimes it can be, it can be in both. Uh, we've noticed in our analysis in that even when you have mixed tumors, the NOS component in these tumors can have higher rate of HER2 amplification compared to newcomers and uh, uh, urethelial carcinomas NOS. So these are difficulties that were mentioned. Again, we lack you know, standardized diagnostic criteria. There's lack of awareness in, uh, in the community, and that can, will always impact your, any genomic study. If you don't have strong diagnostic criteria in the h &E, because this is how you select these cases, your genetic findings are not going to be very clean. Um, and this is, this is a major uh, hindrance for, for studying these, uh, uh, these, these uh, subtypes. Again, this is the paper that was referred to. Uh, this is a reference to some of these mixed cases. What do you do with them? Uh, that's, that's really uh, challenging. Again, this is, I, I bring back this figure, because if you have a tumor here or here, it's easy to call it squamous and urothelial. But if it's here, depending on where, what your preferences and what your criteria are, you may call it urothelial or squamous. Uh, this is another example where this could easily be called plasma cytoid carcinoma, while in reality it is not, despite the absence of fecal adhering, because this tumor is bordering into a sarcomatoid carcinoma. Rhabdoid morphology because it doesn't even have keratin. It cannot be carcinoma in the sense. So this is one when the morphology may deceive you. The same thing, an example here. This could easily be urethelial carcinoma or urethelial with glandular differentiation. But if you do sign up to Pfizer, you'll find that this is actually a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And this tumor can fall into the, can fall into the neuronal subtype, while the pathology report may call this urethelial carcinoma. So always one should be uh, aware of this. Uh, intratumor heterogeneity is a very significant um, problem with urothelial carcinoma. A paper from our, our friends at uh, Penn State showed that depending on the, what tumor, part of the tumor you, you characterize or investigate, you may find a different uh, subtype. So it's always important to know what part of the tumor was sent for any further molecular analysis. And this is highlights, this slide, the, my last slide before the conclusion highlights the real problem. This is within a few millimeters of each other, you can have three or four morphologic subtypes within the same tumor. Uh, so this is my summary. These, these entities remain challenging. They are heterogeneous. There's lack of criteria. Uh, there's no definitive pathognomonic findings. Uh, and then there's still a lot of room to, uh, to, to study these entities. Thank you.
Fantastic talk. Thank, Thank you so much. much. I, I didn't want to cut you off because it was so <laughs> I realized that you didn't. Content, but, uh, you know, I had to do it. So, you know, we'll, we'll take some time now for some discussion because, you know, obviously the two talks were just so rich in content. Um, I'll start off with one. If nobody's been, you know, obviously come up to the mic. So given like the heterogeneity that we're seeing both from the histologic perspective and also the genomic perspective, you know, and also the constraint that we have both financially and also time-wise, pathologists are not going to be able to dedicate like 12 hours a day looking at slides or running through genomic sequencing. So from the research perspective, how do you foresee, like, how should we go about, you know, understanding this disease? And then also from the clinical perspective, you can just, you know, speak to us, like, given what we have today, what are you going to do about, you know, characterizing percentages? Should we use genomic sequencing as an adjunct to the histology reports? Um, yeah, I mean, great question, loaded question. <laughs> I don't know if I, I can answer very. Oh, I, I don't know. If I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. Oh, you can answer. Oh, yeah. Uh, Either. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is no no replacement for having everyone involved in the process. Uh, it's one thing to be practical and have like real world, uh, you know, uh, approach, but you have to have the expertise there. You have to really be able to review. Pathologists are always happy to be part of the process, uh, hopefully in the beginning of the process, where then you can you can plan better when you have input from the pathology rather than just come at the end. Um, and we have, to, we have to invest in the beginning. And I know there is always, you know, the hurry to get things done and the urgency because there are patients waiting. But unless you do things right, we'll always continue, continue to do the same mistake and not learn much. That's my, you know, my, my opinion. I don't know if... Uh, yeah, my question is actually similar, but more <clears throat> specific to plasmocytoid. Do you think that, do you define plasmocytoid as having any head and loss? Is that like definitionally for you? So this is something we struggle with. Something yeah. we see like morphology that's really just plasmocytoid. So we do any head here and it's positive, but it really looks like it's behaving like, you know, so the, <laughs> yeah, so the, yeah the, it's for the most part it's one of those kind of the cleanest subtypes where you have a genetic event you have an ihc that corresponds i agree with you there are some cases where they look perfect for basmocytoid they have e coherent retention that could be explained by one of two things one could be an expression but not functional it could be like a missense mutation still the gene is not functioning but the expression is there another thing is there still i'm sure there will be at some point a another gene that phenocopies e coherent and but we just don't know it yet uh, so ho fortunately these are rare but we do get these cases we struggle with them if the morphology is perfect the way it's growing it's like the entire tumor looks the same we would still call it plasma cytoid thanks yeah. Oh, sorry. This is Omar Al-Halavi from MD Anderson uh, in Houston, and, and I wanted to just highlight or at least sort of ask a question on the previous talk. You know, it was highlighted that when patients relapse with metastatic disease, it tends to be the variant or the subtype that comes back. And, and we did a study that we submitted to SUO as sort of looking at patients who relapse with small cell uh, or neuroendocrine carcinoma after having localized uh, upper tract or lower tract bladder cancer, 60 patients. It, it it's it's changes. I mean, sometimes the relapsing biopsy shows small cell, but sometimes it's a mixed bag of things. Um, and and at cystectomy, you know, we, the three time points between TUR, cystectomy, and then the metastasis at cystectomy, we found basically no patients that had pure small cell. It always was urethelial plus small cell. But in the in the metastatic setting, you do see purity or you know isolated small cell. And, and I, I don't know, you know, from the origin uh, theory that all of this is, is obviously one origin, your theory origin, but when it comes to treatment decisions, do you, um, all, would you always recommend biopsying the metastatic site? And what if there is multiple metastatic sites? Because these might have different responses to our systemic therapies, right? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I agree if yeah, um, you actually you want to start. For, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just think that's a, one of the challenges for sure. You're never going to know exactly what's in every metastatic site, even if you biopsy them, because you're still just getting a yeah. small sample. Um, but I mean, I guess you have to sort of treat on what you see. If you have a biopsy that has small cell in it, then you know you could consider those treatment regimens. 
Yeah, so, so, I mean, I, I, if I want to add, yes, I agree. And the thing is, we don't really know yet what metastasizes, not to be honest with you. The study that was referenced is a great study, but it's a small number of cases. If you look at them, they're like, you know, like a couple of dozen, you know, cases. Yeah. We are doing this analysis. It's not out yet. We re-reviewed our cystectomies. We have like more than 1,500 cystectomies that we re-reviewed. There are some variants that very enriched in the metastasis. Microbabillary is one, plasmacytoid, small cell. If you have a small cell, mixed small cell neurothelial, it's very rare to have the urothelial metastasizing. It's almost always the small cell. But we have many cases where the metastasis is mixed. So, you know, like, like you can easily have a squamous and urothelial in the lymph nodes, urothelial and glandular in the lymph node. Um, so when, unless we do that, we have that work out there, it will still be all over the place. Yeah. Uh, and then you can think about it that a tumor continues to evolve after it metastasizes. It could be two clones coming from two different parts of the tumor have been to metastasize to the same area, yeah. or they could be metastasizing at different times, you know, at one to continuous seeding, one time one part went, another time another component went, and they just happen to kind of latch into the same uh, lymph node. Yeah. Uh, there's still a lot of biology questions to be addressed, but, but at least that kind of uh, background, uh, like you know, prevalence of what is in the metastasis, we don't necessarily know it yet. Yeah. And I and I have to give credit to Dr. Charles Go, who are, you know, our, our pathology lead, you know, helping helping me understand all these differences. And and along the same lines, you know, sometimes we see a biopsy that stains positive for chromogranin or synaptophysin, but doesn't have the small cell appearance, that neuroendocrine. But the IHC is compatible, and then you would, you know you. I see it frequently. The pathologist will say, maybe this is neuroendocrine, but it's only IHC. So, so in, in our traditional approach is that you don't, you don't diagnose the IHC. Uh, <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. But, uh, but sometimes you can't ignore it. If there is extensive neuroendocrine markers, you probably have to refer to it as some neuroendocrine person. I don't know, Francesca, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think um, the morphology sort of for us is, is the thing that triumphs the IHC. So yeah. if it doesn't really have a neuroendocrine look, um, you know. But you know, but, but I'm gonna I'm gonna be the devil's advocate because <laughs> we just showed a slide where if the CDH1 uh, IHC is not there, you know, we we change that. But, but I, I mean, is is um, I don't know how to say it, but because you know, when we get planned the new adjuvant regimens, we have to kind of use these decisions to because we pick different regimens, right? So. So my, I can tell you my, my approach with this, I, we have, you know, it's like you can't help, you have to follow criteria, right? And you have to follow systems. But at the same time, uh, the, my, my mentor used to say, like, use your physician sense now. You have to make a decision at some point. And if it meant just kind of ignoring a classification and call something a different name, it would have to be. Because, you know, at the end, your physician facing a patient, we're physicians facing, you know, a, a tumor, we have to understand it. Yeah. So we know now recognize the large cell variant of, of, uh, of small cell or neuroendocrine carcinoma. The lung people have done it for a long time. We have you know, an, an, a nice cohort now where we're about to publish. Uh, there are some cases where they don't give you any clue that they are neuroendocrine, but they're, you know, they, they, they have extensive neuroendocrine differentiation. And, and by IHC and also by RNA-seq that they cluster with the neuronal subtype. Uh, you can use other, other criteria, like if you do a KI-67 and if a tumor looked, you know, uh, doesn't look like neuroendocrine, but has 90% KI67 expression, that's probably very Definitely. close to being neuroendocrine, even though it doesn't look like a small cell carcinoma. Yeah. So we may use that different terminology just to alert, you know, our clinical colleagues that Makes sense. this tumor probably deserves a little bit more attention. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Right. Well, so, no, <laughs> Not Dave, not Dave. Thank it's, you. Uh, it's, uh, it's because your partner over here took up so much of the questions. No worries. We will have some questions uh, time to time. But uh, fantastic okay. talk. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. Thank you. Thank uh, you. So next, we'll kind of sh shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the challenges of clinical trials in this space. And obviously, given the rarity of the disease space, you know, um, it'll be very difficult to accrue patients. And we have. Fortunately, with us, not only our speakers, but Dr. Andrea Paolo is standing back there, too, who are very expert. But um, first, we'll turn it over to Dr. Rafi Talukdar, who just recently started at Baylor College of Medicine. He's as an assistant professor in um, GU Medical Oncology after finishing his fellowship in University of Washington. And he'll give us a talk on the pilot single arm trial with sazituzumab. Uh, in the neoadjuvant setting for patients with non-neurothelial muscle invasive bladder cancer. Thank you. Um, Dr. Apollo, if I has anything up, just stop me. <laughs> yes, I'm not an expert, and um, I officially 
don't talk my assistant professor job until Monday. So, 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 that's a caveat. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, so essentially I'll just talk about, you know, kind of the clinical trial landscape in, um, patients with, um, non urothelial um, histologic subtypes, um, in the new adjuvants setting. So as you guys know, currently standard of care, platinum-based chemotherapy regimens don't work as well with, you know, a lot of these aggressive subtypes. If there's, Retrospective studies with plasma cytoid, uh, micropapillary, um, sarcomatoid, you know, their um, PCR rates, the pathologic complete response rates in, you know, 15, 20%, which is less than what we see with, um, the, you know, the pure urothelial carcinomas. So, you know, um, this is definitely an area of unmet need and we need more trials in this in this space. So as you guys know, there's, you know, there's been a lot of immune, immune checkpoint inhibitor trials in the muscle invasive setting, you know, the, the Abacus or the Tezolizumab, the Nabucco with Ipinevo, you know, I'm sure, you know, a lot of you guys are either the PIs or involved in any of these trials, but I just wanted to highlight this because um, all but one of these trials allowed or, or included patients that either had pure or predominant um, uh, histologic um, uh, subtypes. And I'll, uh, one thing I'm trying really hard not to say the word variant. So, so, so I'll do my best. So essentially, uh, the Pure O1, which is a which was a phase two study looking at single agent pembrolizumab um, in patients with um, muscle invasive bladder, um, bladder cancer. With um, um, so initially they they did exclude patients that had pre uh, predominant um, non UC histology, but they later allowed it. Uh, essentially. Um, uh, uh, people got three cycles of Pembro and then uh, went to cystectomy. And if you look at the, if you kind of tease out the data more, you know, kind of looking at the um, uh, the predominant uh, um, histologic variant population out of 114, 19 had uh, either pure or predominant uh, uh, um, histologic subtypes. The most common one was squamous cell followed by nested and then micropapillary, there were some sarcomatoid, and there were some mixed ones in there as well. But if you look at the uh, uh, T, uh, PT0N0 um, rate, um, about 16%, so out of three other than 19 patients in this upset analysis with, uh, with uh, histologic subtype had a PCR, whereas in the patient with PRC was, you know, more like the standard number of 40%. So, so you know, so, Based on this, um, uh, Ali Kaki, who's here in Petrus Grievas, they, uh, they uh, opened a trial at UW utilizing prebeluzumab um, with MBAC chemotherapy for, uh, you know, the, for these patients with non urothelial um, uh, histologies. This trial is ongoing. Um, it's a pilot single arm study. These patients have to be cisplatin. Um, they have to be allowed to get cisplatin. Um, we allow N, uh, N1 disease uh, if it's if it's containing the true pelvis and they have to be a candidate for radical hystectomy and they either have to have predominant or pure um, um, proneurothelial histology and we excluded pure small cells um, from this. So they essentially get uh, maximal TU bar T and then they get four cycles of uh, uh, I'm back and then and then three cycles of the Pembrolizumab followed by radical cystectomy. Uh, the primary endpoint is a uh, PCR rate, and then you know we're also looking at um, a secondary endpoints for toxicity, um, um, and then uh, sort of tribal outcomes or uh, recurrence-free outcomes that we're um, doing on translational and correlative studies with this. Um, so this is a pilot study. Goal is for 18 patients. We have. 14 so far. I talked to Petros this morning. Uh, he told me I'm not allowed to say um, the numbers, but it looks pretty promising. So every time I give a speech about this, I have to ask him, can I at least give some preliminary numbers? He's like, no, I don't know it's close. So, so yeah, so the tail looks promising with this. And then I kind of wanted to um, highlight a couple of other trials. Uh, Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Cates and John Hopkins has a trial uh, utilizing a TZO uh, with plantum chemotherapy and toposide in patients with uh, small cell neuro endocrine bladder cancer. This trial is uh, uh, currently still ongoing. Um, and essentially, it's um, uh, they get a toposide, his platin, uh, um, plus it 
he still loads them up for four cycles. And then uh, Dr. Clocking, Dr. Sweenobus in Stanford had a, a nice a small trial uh, using Dervalumab um, in combination with platinum-based new adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, cisplatin or, pla or, or carboplatinum was allowed. Uh, this was a small study, about six patients um, uh, completed treatment. The primary outcome was just safety and toler uh, tolerability. Um, most of the patients did go to uh, our radical cystectomy. One of the patients had a pathologic complete response rate. And in this trial, three patients got dose SM back and uh, three patients got carbogem. And then I, I just kind of wanted to shift towards uh, antibody drug conjugates. As you know, you know, uh, sazituzumab is approved in the metastatic settings, uh, mm -hmm. um, as well as um, infortimate vitotin and now infortimate uh, vitotin plus pembrolizumab. So we kind of wanted to bring this into the new adjuvant setting. And uh, according to the TCGA uh, CHOPE2 data, you know, the numbers are small, but, you know, if you look at some of the, um, some of the non-UC non uh, histologic subtypes, they do have some expression. And then uh, Dr. Fed Gali, Dr. Wright, and um, uh, team at UW did, uh, did recently publish some data looking at differential expression between membrane and cytoplasmic trope 2, um, trope 2 staining you know, with urothelial and some of these uh, histologic subtypes, and they seem to be really similar. So based on this, you know, we, treat, uh, we, uh, we created a trial just using sazatuzumab um, in these patients that are uh, cisplatin in um, 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 not candidates for cisplatin. So we have one with uh, MBAC and Pembro for patients that are cisplatin uh, uh, that can get cisplatin and then uh, Hazituzumab. Essentially, they get uh, three cycles of uh, Hazituzumab and go on to radical cystectomy, and the endpoints are very similar. Pathologic complete response rate is the primary endpoint. We just opened this trial uh, uh, in the beginning of the year, and we have uh, one patient uh, so far. So. And then uh, lastly, I just wanted to quickly highlight uh, Nectin-4, because as you know, uh, EV has, um, is approved in the metastatic setting, and EV um, uh, staining shows similar patterns to TROPE-2 you know, compared to thyrothelial. According to the TCGA database, there is some, there is some expression. And then uh, Dr. Hoffman and her team uh, did publish uh, showing variable Nectin-4 protein expression amongst among the different uh, subtypes. So based on this, we're working on uh, um, ISR, uh, looking at um, EV and Pembro in this setting. Uh, I don't have the uh, schema because we're still undergoing some, uh, some modifications. Um, yeah, so essentially, you know, you know, the, you know, the point of my talk is, you know, this is an area of unmet need. Um, all of these trials are just single, single center pilot trials, and we're kind of, you know, lumping all of these subtypes together. You know, so we definitely need more, you know, bigger, larger trials. You know, multi, multi institutional trials. You know, international trials. You know, um, we need potential pathology review, and I think we need, you know, novel, you know, novel treatments in this space. You know, I think antibody drug conjugates is a good first step, but I think we need to find other, other novel. Um, treatments. That's all. Okay. If you allow us so we can move forward to the next talk and keep the question for both talks uh, until the, the, the end. Thank you. So we will move uh, to the other talk uh, will be given by Dr. Samuel Fenn, so um, medical oncologist from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York and uh, to talk about so the clinical trials and the metastatic setting. So I'll just go into my intro while they're bringing up the slides. My name is Sam Font, I'm a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and I'm very, very grateful to the organizers for the opportunity to speak, and thank you all uh, for your attention. This is very well attended. It's great to see everybody. These are my disclosures. So this is a little bit of background. So I think we've really covered this well um, in terms of the subtypes um, and the poor prognosis associated with them. And also kind of looking at the trials that we've seen, a number of trials over the past decade, um, looking at immune checkpoint blockade in particular, um, with really limited data on how the subtypes do with immune checkpoint blockade. 
Um, and so I actually kind of did the work and looked back at a lot of our major trials and went back to the trials themselves, the protocols themselves, themselves and looked at the inclusion criteria. Um, and you could see these are kind of our, again, I'm not going to cover all of the trials, but you can see that the vast majority of them require predominant urothelial NOS histology. Um, there are several trials that don't specify um, that it needs to be a predominant component, um, but overall, um, that's really the, the, the overriding theme here. Um, now, you would think, if looking at all of these major trials, many of them phase three randomized trials, that there would be a wealth of data um, on, the, um, on the subtypes and how they do with the immune checkpoint blockade. But if we actually look um, from the primary publications, I'm not talking about follow-up publications, but if we actually look at the primary publications from all of these um, industry-sponsored studies, um, we really only have data from EV302. Um, and EB302 gives us the breakdown in terms of how many patients had mixed histology in the EV group versus the chemo group. Um, it kind of specifies a little bit in terms of the histology, but we really have no um, data on how these um, subtypes do um, and how they've done in the trials. And I would love to hear from others if they, if they know of data. But in my mind, you know, these are thousands of patients. They're clearly the vast majority of them are not urothelial NOS. Um, and of many, many mixed histologies, and, and we don't know. Um, so I'm just going to kind of throw out there that, that this is a little bit of a missed opportunity, and I, maybe there should be a question mark after that, because I think there's an opportunity to look at these um, thousands of patients and see potentially how they did um, in our big trials. So we can return to that. So this, this is a trial um, that I was invited to discuss. This was our um, investigator-sponsored study. This was published a number of years back um, in cancer medicine. Um, and I'm going to give a kind of a little bit of a behind the scenes, under the, under the hood look at this trial, um, this small trial and how it was designed. So this is, um, this is a slide I, I, I kind of hesitated to, to include, but um, I think we all, all start with a wish list when we design a trial. Um, and, um, and we um, go to industry and our colleagues in industry and, and um, with ideas, and there's ultimately kind of a back and forth and a negotiation about where we end up. So, so in terms of our study, and this was written in 2017 when I was a new attending, um, in terms of what we wanted, we wanted um, dual immune checkpoint blockade for really no other reason than we thought that this would maximize response rates um, based on the melanoma data that we had at the time. We've since had a lot of data on CTLA-4 inhibition, but again, back in 2017, we wanted a dual immune checkpoint blockade. These are, these are aggressive subtypes. We wanted to take an aggressive approach, and indeed, we did get um, dual immune checkpoint blockade in Dervalumab and Tremolimumab. Um, we wanted to do a multi-center um, investigator-sponsored study. Um, ultimately, we got a single-center IST. I think we all know how we see the budget for these trials balloon when we try and um, bring in other centers. That requires a lot of um, logistical support, a lot of multi-center support. Um, so ultimately, we ended up doing a single-center IST. Um, we wanted to do research biopsies on our study. We've discussed kind of the, the primary versus the MET. It would be great. It would have been great to have known what was in the MET. Um, ultimately, we ended up relying on archival tissue. Um, we wanted to design a study where each histology was its own um, Simon II stage design um, with an overall response primary endpoint. So we would enroll a squamous, a small cell, and an adeno, um, each as its own Simon um, II stage design to kind of flush out um, if, if there was a promising path forward there. Um, ultimately, what we ended up was with one Simon II stage grouping all of histologies, whatever would come in the door, we would put them on the trial. Um, and so you could see kind of the number of patients that we wanted, 81 patients, the number of patients that we ended up with was 27. Now, I don't want to say that I wasn't grateful to our industry partners for the trial. I mean, I was and I am still um, incredibly grateful um, for the opportunity to have done this trial. But I, I did want to kind of disclose this because this is not something that's frequently talked about in terms of a wish list and ultimately what we end up with. Um, so the primary objective was, again, to look at dervalumab and tremolimumab in, um, in patients with non-urothelial um, 
histology, overall response primary endpoint. So just to kind of look a little bit at the inclusion criteria for the trial, because I think there is heterogeneity in, in the way that these trials are done. Um, and it's important, I think, to look at the details. So we were looking at small cell squamous cell and adeno um, of anywhere in the urinary tract. And then we specified that uh, patients with squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma had to have a predominant squamous or adeno component because again, these were patients that were excluded from the other trials. And then we did say that if you have, though if you have any element of small cell or neuroendocrine, then patients fall into that, into that group. And we did specify that for patients to go on the trial with small cell, they had to have progressed after prior, um, typically platinum and etoposide. So those are just kind of two points and we could kind of return to discuss those in a minute. Typical exclusion criteria. So let's look at the results um, for, for our trial. So we treated 13 patients. We accrued um, you know, about one patient per month, which is what we expected. It would took a little over you know, a year to do the trial. Um, the median age was typically a little bit younger than what we see um, um, with, with patients with metastatic urothelial in the trials, and I think that's typical of many of our um, subtypes that these are younger patients. And then in terms of the histologies that we treated, we treated seven patients with small cell neuroendocrine, five of them were pure, two of them were mixed. We treated three patients with squamous, one pure, two mixed predominant, and three adenos, two uracle, and one bladder. So this is you know what came in the door. Um, and so it was, I think, overall kind of a poor prog prognosis patient population. 11 out of the 13 had visceral METs, and we know that these patients typically do worse. Um, a little over half had liver METs, um, which again, we know is a poor prognostic indicator. Um, and the vast majority were, were pretreated with pyroplatinum-based chemo, even though we didn't require that for the squamous and adenohistologies. Um, you know, 11 out of 13 ended up having platinum. So this is how patients did. We had um, zero out of 13 uh, responders. So um, we did not hit the required number of responders to go on to the second um, Simon stage. Just to look at this kind of swimmer's plot there, you could look at uh, the second patient down. That was a patient with small cell. Um, and the patient progressed early with a new liver met that was ablated. Um, and the patients continued on dervalumab and completed the full year of treatment and actually um, did quite well. We did genomics on the study. I'll just say that that one patient with small cell that did the best did happen to have the highest TMB um, of 13.2 mutations per megabase was PDL1 negative. So that, that patient did do well, but again, unfortunately didn't count, count as a responder. Um, these are the PFS plots and the OS plots from, from, the, from the trial. Um, you could see kind of a very poor prognosis patient population that we enrolled. Um, so the conclusions from our kind of very small study um, was that this kind of very small, poor prognosis cohort of patients with non-UC, um, no responses were seen with dervalumab and trimalimumab. I think we all know that we need novel therapeutic strategies. So now, now this is kind of the part of the talk where I'm going to reflect a little bit um, and kind of review some of the data. I think it's great following Rafi, who um, discussed data in the neoadjuvant muscle invasive space. So I'm going to kind of discuss some data in the metastatic space. Um, so this is the data that's been reported. This is um, Andrea's data um, from Iconic. Um, and she was kind enough um, to provide me with some slides. So this was um, a study where she did um, Cabo Nevo, and there's also some Cabo um, uh, Nevo and IPI patients that were treated um, in, in the phase one study. And this is, and she did see responses, kind of looking at the same histologies um, in terms of 15-uracle uh, and adeno um, patients that she treated. There was an overall response rate of 20%. They, she also saw responses in the squamous, um, seven patients with squamous um, histology with a, a very high overall response rate of 85.7. Um, and then there were three patients with small cell that were treated, um, and, um, and one of them um, was a responder. So there, there clearly are responses, we just didn't see any in our study. Um, this is a study that um, Bradley McGregor led out of Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Um, and this was part of a larger kind of not only the variants, but other, um, I think uh, it, it included some of the non clear cell histologies. And um, it was kind of a large basket trial. But um, at um, ASCO in 2019, um, he, he um, provided the, the specifically the, the, the subtype um, bladder data. And his trial was at Nevo. Um, Nevo 3, it'd be one every three weeks. Um, and he also saw some responses in the small number of patients that he treated. Um, one out of the four adenos, one of the four uracles, two out of the six squamous cell, um, two out of the three small cells responded. And then he also saw the one out of one plasma cytotype respond with an overall response rate of 37% if you include all of his variants. This is the SOL study. So this was actually a safety study done with a TESO, kind of a large phase 3B um, expanded study. 
This study um, accrued a huge number of patients, 997 patients that received Atezo in 37 countries worldwide. This was led by Cora Sternberg, and um, they included patients that weren't traditionally included in the um, in, in the other kind of registration trials. These were kind of non-registration patients with poor ECOG, with some kind of um, uh, well-controlled autoimmune disease. And um, just to focus on the variant data, 47 or 4.7% had variant or mixed histology. You could see the histologies here. We don't have response rates per subtype, um, but we see an overall response rate of 9%, so a bit low. This is the STRONG study, very similar idea as the SOL study, but with dervalumab instead of atezolizumab. A large number of patients were treated. 8% um, had mixed histology. And they, we, all we have really from this study um, led by Guru was that the, the, the non-urothelial patients seem to do as well um, in terms of um, OS as the urothelial patients. So kind of limited, very high level data, not granular data. So what additional data is coming? Um, in the metastatic space for the for the subtypes. Um, so just to highlight and give a huge shout out to the to Andrea who's in the audience um, for the iconic study. We're all waiting for these data. This is a very well designed study um, in terms of each histology um, as it, on its own and looking for response rates, squamous small cell adenope. There's a plasma site to it and sarcomatoid cohorts as well. Um, so this is a really highly anticipated um, and important study. Um, there's also the, the DART study or the SWOG 1609 study um, that was a large kind of BMS uh, multi-cohort study of IPI nevo So we have a number of publications from these studies um, in different diseases, metaplastic breast cancer. Um, there was one in angiosarcoma. There was one um, in um, high-grade neuroendocrine neuroendocrine neoplasms, not um, of the urinary tract, but of other sites. Um, another one in non-pancreatic neuroendocrine. So we're just, we're waiting on the bladder cancer with variant histology data. Um, I, I am not aware of any uh, yet. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I couldn't find this data yet. And I think it's to come. Um, this is another small study out of UCLA in the metastatic space for um, neuroendocrine of the urinary tract or prostate. Um, with PEMBRO, with um, etoposide and, and platinum um, that seems to have completed accrual. It took four years to complete the study um, and we're waiting on data. So what are the important directions? Where do we go from here? What are the important questions? What should we be thinking about um, when we're thinking about you know, the subtypes and, and moving the needle forward? So let's look actually at the NCCN guidelines. My, my slide got messed up. Um, so this is where we are. Um, I think um, you know, we've, if you look at the NCCN guidelines for bladder, they've evolved tremendously over the last 10 years, but this is pretty much the same slide. Um, you know, as it was 10 years ago, we really um, don't have um, really that much improvement. Um, for the mixed histologies, you know, because they were included in the trial, we treat them like pure urothelial NOS. We don't know um, really how they do. Um, we, we are in desperate need of clinical data. For the pure squamous patients, um, we're left with very limited options um, in the NCCN, really, um, in terms of combination chemo, um, taxol, IFOS, cis. Um, we're, we're really left with quite little for the pure adenos, um, same thing. Um, we kind of extrapolate um, from the treatment of patients with adeno um, GI tract cancers with full FOX and other regimens um, with really very, very limited data. Now for small cell, they've said you could treat it like small cell of the lung. Um, which I think actually gives us a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of latitude to, to extrapolate from those patients. And I think many of us are already treating them with combination of toposide platinum um, and either Derva or, or um, Atezo based on the small cell lung cancer data. So we do have some latitude there. I would just say, I think we've all gone, those of us who treat patients with variant histologies, um, particularly the pure squamous and pure adenos have been on the phone with, with payers trying to get immune checkpoint blockade approved, but have had a difficult time because again, we don't have NCCN um, guidance there. And I, would, and I would think, particularly for the pure adenos, maybe we should have some more latitude in extrapolating from colon cancer, um, like we do for small cell of the lung. Um, and maybe we should kind of be referring to the NCCN guidelines for colon, because I think that's what many of us are trying to do in practice. So just um, as one, um, you know, kind of um, another question, should we be doing industry-sponsored studies or should we be doing ISTs? And this is one example from non-clear cell RCC that I think um, is quite um, important to note. So the industry-sponsored study, Keynote B61, um, kind of shows the power of industry. 41 centers, 14 countries, they, um, in less than a year, 
They enrolled 158 patients with non-clear cell RCC. It was just published in Lancet Oncology, and I think will ultimately make it into the, into the NCCN. No, I don't want to kind of, this is not to badmouth the investigators doing a very similar IST in the same patient population with the same um, agents, but just shows the difficulty of doing an IST. This study started um, initially as one center in the US, it's now four. It started in July of 2020. Um, and it's still ongoing, and they're looking only to enroll 34 patients, um, and we don't know when that will be published. So that, that really just shows the power of industry. If they want to get something done, you know, they, they get it done. Um, and, I, and, it's, um, and I think it, it's stark, and so what really, you know, is the direction there? So um, this is what I call, so this is a target-based approach, you know, in treatment of, uh, you know, of our subtypes, and, or, or you could also refer to this as the piggyback approach. Um, so this is just one example of the study, particularly for our neuroendocrine or small cell patients, there's a promising therapeutic target in that patient population called DLL3. And I think a number of companies are targeting that. This is one example um, of a study which we have open. And it's a study really designed for small cell cancer of the lung. Um, because that's a much more common disease. But they're also allowing, if you look at bullet points two and three, patients with um, neuroendocrine or small cell histologies that start in other organs. So we could actually get our small cell bladder patients or our small cell urinary tract patients on this trial. And, and to kind of use the slang, there's no, there's no shame in that game, so to speak. I think that, you know, I, I, as long as we could get our patients on trials, that we might not always be able to lead them, but if we could generate data and hopefully again, and, and update those NCCN guidelines, um, then I think that, that that's, you know, that's perfectly fine. Um, so the piggy branch approach is one way. Um, I, um, oh, I'm missing a slide here. Um, I, I did want to give out a, a shout out to the, um, the Global Society of Rare Genitourinary Tumors. I think we saw some great data recently in penile cancer, um, which is another rare disease um, that Talal El Zarif um, presented at GU ASCO this year, where there was hundreds of patients with penile cancer that he gathered from around the globe. And now we finally have an idea of what the response rate is in penile cancer because of that amazing um, collaborative international effort. Um, so I think that that's another great example um, of how we can move the, 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 um, the, the needle forward. So we have to collaborate. We have to collaborate with industry. Um, and, and again, I am grateful for, for the work that we did with our trial. And I think that there is still kind of ways forward and ways to collaborate and improve outcomes for these patients. I think when we're doing small ISTs, we need to consider carefully, this is, might seem obvious, but how is it going to lead the the, you know, the needle forward. Are we going to be able to update the NCCN? Are we going to be able to do larger trials? Um, and, and what are we really learning from small ISTs? Um, we have a lot of large industry sponsored trials out there. These patients should be studied. Um, we have some important data coming in terms of Iconic and SWOC 1609. Um, and for our patients with pure squamous and pure adeno, there's really no known role for immunotherapy in these patients. These are major unmet needs. These are typically young patients. Um, we really need to urgently move the bar forward there. In terms of a target-based tumor agnostic approach, that might be advantageous. As I mentioned, the DLL3 example, uh, we need more science and we need more collaboration always um, um, to move the, 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 the bar forward. I, I love the GSGRT. I'd love to be a member of that that club, if you'll have me, um, and I think that, um, that 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 there is kind of hope for the future and, and moving the, the needle forward. Thank you so much for your attention, everybody. Great, um, fantastic talk, and uh, you're absolutely invited to be part of our group um, moving this forward because you've done a lot of thinking about how to move this disease space forward, Sam. So, you know, I wanted to kind of open it up again for some time for discussion. Um, one of the questions that I had, uh, Sam and, and uh, Rafi, for you both, and also for Andrea, you may be able to speak to this. How do we get it done? <laughs> I know it's going to be a loaded question, too. But, you know, obviously in the kidney cancer um, setting, they went to industry. I don't know how they got industry to get interested in their uh their concept because i've talked to industry about even like genomically sequencing a lot of tumors and they show no absolutely no interest whatsoever um so how how do you engage industry to better run these studies and then just from the design standpoint since you know um Hickmott and and uh and um uh, francesca have have told us that there's no targets for these specific subtypes so how do we actually like 
tell what type of therapy to use for um, some of these? Do you basket them all in one trial, go through different sequential treatments? How do you do it? So I'll just comment to that. It, it is difficult to get industry interested in these in these studies. I have met with them many times um, about the iconic and about other trials, and um, they they are willing to support investigator initiated trials, but not so much themselves run these small studies because you know they have other priorities, and it's. It's all about their priorities. Um, one thing I'll mention, because I think it's important, is um, I had a miscellaneous rare tumor cohort because we had 12 cohorts, and you just can't cover all of the rare tumors that there are, and I wanted to be as inclusive as possible. And although I, I thought this was you know, such a great way to include a lot of patients, it's really hard to interpret the data because in the end, we ended up with, I think, everybody wanted to enroll in the miscellaneous because they were all, you know, kind of this esoteric cell type that wasn't classified. And it, it, it's, it's hard to say, okay, well, maybe we should expand it. It's one patient. And, and so um, I think there's pros and cons to that, but, you know, I found it that it's difficult to interpret. So Unfortunately, we have to pick the more common rares, which I know sounds kind of, you know, like an oxymoron, but I think in order to kind of move the needle forward, and we've been trying to, you know, because of their rare, we try to be inclusive, but then, then, we're, then we're not able to interpret the data, kind of, you know, exactly what happened with your study. You wanted to kind of group it, but then you get, you just don't get a lot of these. And I, I think cooperative groups are, are great for doing this, although it just takes a long time to open a cooperative group study. Um, doing it uh, yourself, you know, within your institute and having several collaborators is, is good too, but then you, I feel like you're also kind of missing a lot of other um, uh, uh, potential patients that are out there. It, it is hard to cast a wide net. So I think it's really challenging. And I think s groups like the, the society group, the Global Society Group of Rare Geotumors is so important so we can kind of develop this network and we all know of these trials so we can refer and we can accrue and we can learn. Yeah, I think, Andrea, that's a great, um, I don't really have all that much to add. I think it's it's challenging um, when approaching industry partners here. I think it's all about answering a question. Um, you know, for our patients with that metastatic adenocarcinoma, does immune checkpoint blockade work? And I think, um, you know, really looking forward to the iconic data and, and, and kind of um, and trying to answer that question. So I think if you could kind of go specifically, I think we just need to see the data that's out there and, um, um, you know, hopefully move the needle forward here. Because if, if, if we're doing lots of small ISTs, I think if we could somehow pool our, um, our efforts and accrue a large number of patients and, you know, um, and power studies appropriately, then that's how we move the thing, that, you know, the needle forward. I just uh, have a quick question. So, I mean, this has been a great panel. I'm sorry I had to step out during Sam and part of Rafi's talk as well. But so as basic and translational scientists, what we try to do is figure out the mechanisms that lead to these subtypes. We call them subtypes now, not variants. Um, <laughs> so we, you know, we've spent a lot of time thinking about the squamous component, right? Um, but I think this panel has inspired me a little bit in some of my conversations with Hekmat, I think, over the years, too. So if we were to think about the next variant to really focus on, right, there's lots of things to think about. Is it present in metastatic disease, yes or no? How rare, is it more common of the rares? Or uh, um, what should we focus on? Like what should be the next thing? Is it like I feel, I'm feeling like sarcomatoid today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but is there, is there a, I, so you know, we have a panel of medical oncologists, urologists, our esteemed pathologists, what do you guys think? I think we, we should go after what's most common um, and kind of start there, um, what's affecting the greatest number of our patients. Um, you know, and, and I think our pathologists can, can help with that. And I think there, like I said, there is data out there on how these subtypes actually do from large trials. If we could just somehow collect that data um, and look at it, even if it is retrospective, that's better than, than nothing, um, which is what we, what we have now. Um, 
I'll, ju I'll just add that I also think um, this target-based approach, the DLL3 example um, being one, where if there's a promising therapeutic target, then, then we should run with that, even if it's um, an add-on to another disease, uh, uh, even if it's an add-on to a trial that's really geared toward another disease. If there's a promising target, then we should generate that data. And I think if our, you know, the, if our industry partners see that there are responses, then they'll run with that. I mean, I, to, to answer the question simply, whatever variant or subtype that you have access to and good material, you got to work on that one. Because all of them are important. We're, we don't know much about pretty much any one of them. So there's, all, there's need on all of them to do something. And if you have access to a unique cohort, you know, clinical colleagues, pathology colleagues, that's what you got to go after. Any, any additional piece of information and knowledge is very, is very important going to inform us in dealing with other, with the other subtypes. Yeah, this, this is a great session. And one of the reasons it's such a great session is because it's so interdisciplinary. Um, I wanted to make two comments. You know, from, from a surgeon's perspective, the thing I always get nervous about with a trial for, that's neoadjuvant is that the therapy you're choosing is not going to work and my patient's going to progress and four months have gone by and man, I might have had a resectable disease that because I put this patient on a trial, it's not resectable. So I think there were some assumptions made that neoadjuvant therapy is the right approach for some of these variants as opposed to maybe an adjuvant approach. And I wanted to hear your, your thoughts on that and whether it varies by subtype, not to throw another variable in the mix. Um, but then there's sort of this broader question that's also interesting, which is how do you negotiate IITs in a perioperative setting? Um, I think Jeannie Hoffman sends this, who just left, but I will plug her trial with, oh, with small cell, because the way that was negotiated is essentially patients can get their systemic therapy uh, at Hopkins, but the surgeon can be in any of the 10 states that surround us uh, as a way to try to negotiate that tension. Um, and I think we're going to need to be creative uh, in, in that way. And then, you know, we can't have, I can't see a patient with a variant histology and say what surrounding five states is there a, a trial with this variant. We, it has to be under one roof. And so I do think cooperative groups uh, with some type of basket design where we have an answer for five to seven variants is going to be the, the way to actually do this. And it'll take eight to 10 years. So would love your thoughts on it. Yeah, th thanks, Max, for the question. Just take your first question in terms of neoadjuvant versus adjuvant. I think the typical paradigm for a lot of these variants, um, when we think about particularly the pure squamous and the pure adenos, is that neoadjuvant therapy, as we, as, as Rafi said, you know, typically doesn't. Um, we don't pursue that path, and we do go straight to surgery. And so I think, you know, in the perioperative space with the variants, potentially looking at that adjuvant space. But adjuvant trials. The problem with adjuvant trials is it takes a long time to to accrue and to get your answer. Whereas with the neoadjuvant trials, you kind of have a you know, at least a, a path CR, a path, the path staging, downstaging endpoint. So, you know, I think that adjuvant may be the way to go, but it's harder to do the trials. Um, it is a multidisciplinary panel. Um, we are missing our radiation oncology colleagues, um, you know, from the panel, but it might be interesting to see, you know, how, how does radiation play a role in a lot of these variants, uh, particularly um, sometimes we do see HPV-driven squamous and, or HPV-driven tumors, and should those be treated more with a chemo or RT approach? Um, and then in terms of your other point about being creative about trials, I mean, absolutely. I think there's this concept of decentralized trials. We have to be creative um, in terms of thinking about how to accrue to these trials, um, you know, and to capture as many patients as, as, uh, as possible. I don't know if I... Yeah, that's a small comment. Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the target, you know, uh, um, markers we need to capture is, you know, time to cystectomy, you know, so like, you know, these small, you know, independent trials, you know, seeing, you know, if we're actually delaying the time to surgery. So I think that'll hopefully help, you know, you know, address that question. And yeah, I think uh, co-op groups studies are the best, you know, way to go basket trials focusing on, you know, maybe like the aggressive subtypes. I think that's, that's the best way we can get, you know, a large, you know, multi-institutional um, collaborative, you know, uh, effort to go forward, but from, from what I hear, it's hard, so. <laughs> Just a, a quick comment also, on, sorry if I, I so uh, one thing, I may, I may sound a little radical, but 
I just don't know. Yeah, it's a it's a bad peeve also. Uh, I don't know why we insist on making divine histology dominant or non-dominant or give any percentage because it's not like we have a good basis for why we choose 10, 20, 30, 50 percent. That's one thing. And second, it's not like our target is actually after the variant histology. We're giving global drugs that, that we don't know what they're targeting and what they're treating. So why is like the 30 percent, 40 percent of small cell plasma cell micropapillary, is, is it worse theory than the, the 50 per, or like the 10 percent or the 50 percent? Um, is it is it, the, are we looking at the entire tumor? We're looking at UR, maybe we took the part that has mostly the micropapillary, but the rest of the tumor is not micropapillary. And if you looked at a different section or a different surgeon gave you another UR, you're putting the patient in a different category. So I don't know if this is, if there's a role, like as, you know, as physicians, try to, can I change that, that mindset? Why is it, you know, predominant urothelial? Why is it, you know, a unique pineal histology? Otherwise, I mean, unless we treated these patients, we will not know if they really respond or they don't respond. But we just left them out for the most part. And again, our treatments are not targeting these variant histologies or the urothelial component, and we don't know it. So I think this, I mean, it would be great if, if we can kind of push back in the industry that this criterion has like no basis, no scientific basis. Uh, unless we do the work, we will not know. And hopefully, hopefully that, that you know, might, might change. Last question. Oh, I have a few. <laughs> This is an amazing panel. This is absolutely wonderful. Thanks for putting this together. This is really fun to be in the audience. I have a couple of thoughts. First of all, Sam, thank you for putting that slide up. I mean, there's a lot of junior people in the room. You know, as we, it's hard to develop these studies. So for you to be brave enough and say, this is what we wanted and this is what we got. I've never seen a slide like that. It's really important. Um, thank you for talking about the small cell study. It took seven years and discussions with four companies to open that trial. You know, and, and it's a turtle, but I'm trying. So thank you very much. I mean, we're, we're, we're all trying. Um, I think we've all kind of been down the same path of, you know, asking for, for what we know is really important and not getting it. And I think it's time for all the people in this room to start having different conversations. The FDA should mandate that if a drug company wants to, you know, do work in this space, they also need to pay attention to the people with the biggest unmet need. And there's a lot of people in this room, this is an advocacy meeting. I mean, we, it, would, it would be great to have the advocates kind of come with us and talk about all the patients that are left behind. You know, we have all these great new drugs and all this great, you know, survival, but we don't know how these great new drugs work. And importantly, in some of these variant subtypes, there are patients, you know, more patients in the squamous, you know, uh, subtype, there's more African-American patients in that subtype than all the others. So really a huge unmet need that we are not paying attention to. So thank you for talking about variant histology. You have so much work to do. Um, finally, from an industry perspective, if you have a drug that's not FDA approved, then we have spaces where there is no standard of care. That's really important. So maybe the industry partners can start paying attention to these spaces as a real unmet need so we can get drugs approved. This is awesome, guys. Thank you. All right, so um, thank you so much for that impassioned statement. I, I definitely um, second your opinion. So last but not least, I want to turn the floor over to my uh, co-chair, Karima Walala, um, who actually came all the way from Morocco. Um, so she's an assistant professor at Hassan University in Morocco, uh, associate professor, I apologize. Um, and that will be... And she will be giving us a global perspective on what variant histology looks like, um, mostly in Africa. So really, really looking forward to your talk, Karima. Thank you, Roger, for this kind introduction. It's a really pleasure for me to be with you today. Coming a long way from Africa, from Morocco. And when I was asked to talk about this general perspective, first thing I did, I sent an email to Roger. What do you, what are you waiting for me to talk about after all what has been said? So from pathology, genomics, clinical trials. So we try to uh, uh, cover some points that maybe are not uh, always discussed in the guidelines, which are the disparities in access to diagnosis, to treatment. It's very exciting to see all these advances in terms of genomics, of defining targets 
targets, etc., big uh, advances in drugs trial, but also we should not forget that in some parts of the world, uh, this is not the priority. The priority is to eradicate some endemic infection that are major risk factor behind this cancer, but also to have some democracy in terms of access to diagnosis, to treatment. But also I will not only talk about the specificities from Africa, but I will also highlight the management of uh, uh, of those variants from the perspective of med oncologists. So, uh, well, um, this introduction has already been said by uh, all uh, um, panelists, so there is no optimal systemic therapy for those variant bladder cancer given the rarity of this disease. And uh, so uh, we are happy to see all the advances in comprehension of genomic profiling of those variants that will allow to define uh, targets that can be actionable uh, uh, like what we see in the other common or conventional cancers. And I think that there is a huge need of co collaboration. So in order to have strong data coming from uh, uh, from trials, because we still have uh, data coming only from case series, databases, expert opinions, and some small uh, single arms. So since I will be talking about specificities in Africa, so here is a study, um, a meta-analysis, including uh, 22 studies carried out across 15 uh, African countries uh, with the objective to, to determine the incidence of bladder cancer in, in, in Africa. And we can see here that the pooled incidence was estimated to be uh, 7 per 100,000 population in men and 1.8 uh, for uh, women. So it's uh, predominant for male cancer also in Africa. But we can also have that in Africa, we have disparities across the same continent. So we have a higher incidents when we move to Egypt, for example, uh, Tunisia, Libya. Well, for my country, Morocco, uh, bladder cancer, it's not that a huge public health problem like it is in Egypt or some sub-Saharan countries like Tanzania and others where we have endemic infection that is behind the high incidence of uh, uh, bladder cancer. So this is the statistics of Morocco from Global Can. So you can see that for male uh, population, it's the fourth one. Uh, uh, but when we move to Egypt, it's really a, a huge public health problem. So we, for both genders, it's the third one behind the uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, also due to a viral infection that is very common in Egypt and then breast. And when we move to male patients, so it's the second one after uh, liver uh, uh, cancer. So it's not prostate, it's not lung, but it's not hepatocellular carcinoma and bladder and the second rank. So. Uh, uh, here also, I can um, you can see that for the, the, the histology, we see clearly that the squamous cell carcinoma is the predominant subtype in Africa, uh, uh, with this strong link I mentioned with the bilateral infection, and you can see that from um, from country to country there is a difference, but we have between 30 and 70 percent of uh, uh, histology that is attributed to squamous cell carcinoma. So this is the predominant subtype that we have in the continent. So when we move uh, to the management of bladder cancer in those different countries, so we can see first of all that uh, I think the, the thing that, that stopped me first is, you know, the rate of advanced disease, which is huge. So we have more advanced T stage, more node involvement, more metastatic stages, and 27% of uh, cases are inoperable given this, uh, based on this advanced stage. So this is make prognosis poorer. And uh, 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 we have also uh, tried to understand or to, 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 to see what had, how is the sensitivity to treatment in those countries. We have different references here, and we have you <laughs> Uh, reported some radio resistance and chemo resistance for this squamous cell carcinoma compared to the common urothelial carcinoma. So I think uh, one first key message from Africa that we have a growing incidence. Fortunately, we have now more and more eradication of the infection. So especially in Egypt, uh, where we have this decline in terms of uh, bladder cancer incidence, but we still don't have accurate statistics uh, to, to, to confirm uh, this. Also, we need uh, really um, accurate data, accurate sources, and the collection of uh, data from all our, so because we don't have really accurate data about the statistics in Africa. So. Uh, um, Another point, since we are talking about disparities, 
I thought to, to, to put this slide that was presented in last ASCO G 2023, and it, it shows simply the cost of bladder cancer. And you can see here that the cost is really high, and even it's keeping uh, getting higher over time. So when we made the projection on 2030, it will uh, reach around uh, $12 billion. So it's a costly cancer, and this cost also becomes higher uh, uh, when we have more complications, so for treatment, either surgery or treat medical treatment. And this cost also is becoming much higher when we move from localized disease to regional disease to metastatic disease. Why I, uh, I mentioned this um, this uh, this uh, particularity of the cost of bladder cancer just to let you know that yeah we are happy to see those genomics and those uh, drugs uh, and on, on, in the ongoing trials but also this cost is really a barrier for for many countries um, talking about africa to have access to correct health care uh, uh, for bladder cancer but also for all the other cancers so, uh, well, let's uh, move to the variants uh, and the highlights and the management and some particularities. And I will start with squamous cell carcinoma that I have mentioned is the most frequent subtype in Africa. And uh, the management for sure for localized disease for early stages is based on cystectomy. We had uh, local recurrence that is common uh, and which is, which is responsible to uh, poor uh, su survival. And uh, uh, um, the, so the, there is no proven role of chemotherapy in the early stage, so for, for the new adjuvant and adjuvant. But we have uh, more radiosensitivity that was reported in the Egyptian series, so where they compared, for example, in this study, the radiotherapy in the post operative setting compared to cystectomy alone. And you can see here that the five year uh, uh, disease-free survival was improved with the use of post-operative radiotherapy with 41% versus 25 for cystectomy alone. Uh, also, in this uh, other Egyptian study, we have uh, tested this post-operative radiotherapy in the squamous cell, uh, bilarsial squamous cell bl bladder cancer, and we have reported again that there is uh, you know, improvement of survival with the use of post-operative radiotherapy, uh, um, and between brackets in this study also they tested the role of uh, misonidazole in the adjuvant setting but they didn't seem to add any gain uh, in terms of survival so what about the advanced disease for uh, um, the squamous uh, cell carcinoma? So um, we have this prospective trial evaluating the, the phosphamide, paclitaxel, and cisplatin for uh, the, the advanced non-transitional cell carcinoma, uh, mainly uh, growing from the epithelial component, so the squamous cell adenocarcinoma and small cell carcinoma. And it has shown that this uh, protocol or this regimen is active in this disease and may be suggested for patients. For the other epithelial uh, um, variant, the adenocarcinoma, so uh, we know that, uh, so it has been already discussed that we should always look if it's the pure or it's just you know, a differentiation. So uh, from ureteral carcinoma, uracle, non uracle So with this uracle adenocarcinoma that has the specificity to, uh, uh, of younger onset, it can be uh, um, the, the, the median overall survival from the MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, is around 46 months. And when we look uh, at the genomic landscape of the adenocarcinoma, and I think it was already mentioned in, in previous talks, so we had uh, this particularity of having uh, some Kiras mutations, so the PIK3 and the TP53. And uh, with this similarity, uh, sometimes with the enteric cancer or colon cancer, we find that uh, we, uh, we tend to use, and this is from uh, uh, Andrea, uh, present with us here, so showing the, 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 the chemotherapy options for the patients with adenocarcinoma that can include the five if you uh, based on the similarity with the colon cancer with some modest uh, response or uh, modest outcomes. We can also even use some biologics like the anti-GFR based on the cura status or the bevacizumab. Uh, otherwise, so we have the other option of paclitaxel, platinum, phosphamide regimens. 
So for the urethral adenocarcinoma, so just to mention that surgery is the basis or the backbone of treatment. So we have this possibility of partial uh, uh, cystectomy uh, uh, that with no difference in terms of survival versus radical cystectomy. Uh, there is no strong evidence to support a new adjuvant or adjuvant therapy for this uh, uh, subtype. And regarding the multimodality uh, uh, approach, so we have this uh, um, this this. this the study that I have shown that plus we have localized disease, negative margin, negative lymph node, and the resection of the ligament. So we have improved overall, uh, 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 improved survival for those patients. So same here. So we can see that for the non uracal adenocarcinoma, the multimodal approach based on surgery and radiotherapy is better than radiotherapy alone. Well. Micropapillary arterial carcinoma, a lot has been said by our pathologists. So uh, um, it's uh, associated with poor prognosis, aggressive course of the disease, and this particularity of HER2 overexpression and amplification. Uh, and uh, in this uh, study from the MD Anderson, again, for our, with our friend Ashish, uh, who is not unfortunately with us, so they have underlined that it's associated with poorer prognosis, with more advanced disease, 44% uh, or I have T2 or more, and a quarter of patients are not positive. And we have seen that the overall survival was similar if we are in non-muscle invasive or muscle invasive, but we also underlined from this study something very important is that this subtype is not responsive to the intravesical uh, uh, immunotherapy, uh, the, the BCG therapy. So maybe those patients should be offered uh, cystectomy, early cystectomy. Uh, also uh, here regarding the always the micropapillary bladder cancer. So we can uh, see that when we give the new adjuvant chemotherapy, so we improve the rate of pathological response and complete pathological response with here around 45% who became PT0, uh, which uh, um, uh, confirm the necessity to include those patients in the approach of new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery. So the HER2 pathway, it has been uh, discussed and we have uh, data coming from the this uh, phase uh, one uh, trial, so with the trastuzumab, the Ruxtican, this EDC that you know uh, is now very famous in solid tumors and oncology with the spectacular results in breast cancer, but not only, also in lung cancer and even in digestive cancers. And here we have seen that there is promising also results in urothelial carcinoma with near 77% of disease control, which is very exciting. So uh, small cell bladder cancer, very aggressive. We know it's a highly proliferative disease and uh, um, in, in, in general, so with more uh, node positive, more metastatic disease, shorter survival. We know that it's highly proliferative, but also it's highly responsive to treatment, so to chemotherapy based on uh, cisplatinum. That's why also those patients should be treated in a multi-modality approach with chemotherapy or radiochemotherapy in the new adjuvant setting, so followed by uh, cystectomy. And here I uh, just bring you this uh, um, slide from the ASCOGU 2023 uh, comparing so uh, um, the neuroendocrine uh, carcinoma and non endocrine carcinoma of bladder cancers. And we have seen that despite that we have more advanced stages, so we have uh, similar outcomes between the two groups. And this is the real world uh, uh, data confirming the need uh, so of uh, so treating uh, adequately those uh, patients as early as possible. So um, here, uh, again, in the small, um, uh, the, this is phase two clinical trial of the new adjuvant chemotherapy uh, with ephosphamide, doxorubicin, and etoposide cisplatin in the small cell urothelial cancer. And you see here also that it plays a major role in the new adjuvant setting. It can improve uh, 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 the outcome of patients. Where, yeah, we, we, but we can say that, uh, see that for the metastasis static sitting, the, the prognostic is really uh, poor, but also we have uh, seen that there is a, um, some predilection for the spectrum of metastasis for those uh, small cell cancers, so uh, that's why it's mandatory to go in the workup for the brain, imagine, since we have this tropism to brain metastasis. Well, uh, here just a um, uh, short message for the sarcomatoid versus the classic urothelial carcinoma. Uh, this is uh, 
This is a, a, a paper that shown so uh, that was presented in last ASCO and showed that it has poor prognosis and perioperative chemotherapy with surgery was associated with improved survival outcomes compared to surgery alone. So I think if we have a message so to, to keep in mind after um, all what uh, what we saw is that all those cancers like that like the conventional urotelial carcinoma should always be taken uh, uh, in a multidisciplinary approach. No one can treat a patient alone so it's always mandatory to have the per so the point of view from the pathology the genomics and also discuss all those parameters with the surgeon and oncologist radiotherapist for better care for our patients well for immunotherapy we have seen that there are a lot of ongoing trials we have some uh, the, some data coming from the trials presented uh, in previous talk and here it's just a fringe uh, a multi center retrospective study taking patients with non erotelial brain cancer and we try to see the the, the, the response and the outcome for those patients received uh, who received chemotherapy or immunotherapy we can see that the the rate of overall response is much more important with chemotherapy reaching 66% versus 22 for immunotherapy. But I uh, uh, remind you that it's only about nine patients. So a lot of work also should be done in terms of including a lot of patients. So in clinical trials, and this cannot be achieved without an international effort in order to uh, overcome this rarity of the disease. So uh, my final thought, so is, as we all concluded that uh, uh, there is no um, well-established guidelines for the treatment of uh, those rare variants, but I think the main message again is an international collaboration uh, for this rare entity uh, in order to match it to, and, and I want also to underline to, to not forget other parts of the world when we do clinical trials, but uh, because this is the best way, you know, to have the real image of what is happening uh, for bladder cancer and particularly the, the rare variants that are uh, present not only in uh, Europe, Asia or America, but also in uh, Africa and other parts of the world. And this uh, international effort uh, cannot be achieved without, you know, uh, societies that think uh, uh, about these rare entities. And here again, I remind you about the role of Global Society of Rare Gene Tumors. I have the honor to be council member in this society and we have uh, subcommittees uh, by organ site but also by uh, pathology and uh, the main focus is yeah to raise uh, those challenges and try to find solutions through uh, international collaboration and this collaboration has been also uh, more reinforced with uh, this uh, collaboration with the international bladder cancer group and i wish uh, once again that we can achieve with those international collaborations more comprehensive for the situation in all over the world and try to have better outcomes for patients in every part of the world and thank you. Great. All right. I think, you know, in the interest of time, um, well, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Um, it's really been a great session. I think the session highlights the difficulty of moving this disease space forward and really understanding what the, the biology of the disease is, what the targets of therapy may be, and also how we can bring about everybody so that we can, you know, uh, uh, get trials going in this disease space. So thank you very much. Um, have a great rest of the meeting and safe travels back.